Bro, we almost came home with two dogs. End of day five so of the dog. Dark... Yeah, no, it was not good. It wasn't good. Um, end of day five, we had just wrapped five o'clock. We decided to drive home rather than stay in Mexico Beach. You know, three of us just, hey, we'll each take like a two hour shift and we'll get home. We'll get home by like midnight. It's fine. We're 20 minutes in the drive and two puppies come out oh. of the woods oh. in front of us. Yeah. Onto the road, one way road, going like leaving Mexico Beach. There's woods right there, and I stopped very abruptly yeah. to see two puppies, very pretty dogs, walking across the street. This breaks my heart. Brittany damn near jumps out of the truck while driving. The we look over to the right, and there's another puppy coming out of oh. the out of the woods. Yeah, and mom and dad are right behind it. And I, oh, mom and dad were there. Yeah. Right? Okay, okay. Okay. And okay. I was like, okay, everything's fine. And I started driving away. <laughs> I was say, that as soon as you said mom and dad were there, it cleared up the mental headspace yeah. for me because I was and like, all I, was I like, heard, this evil person left those two puppies all, on the side of the road. All I heard for the next twenty minutes was how I'm a terrible person, <laughs> and I should have stopped, and, and we could have, we should have taken the puppies. And, and how, parents? And, yeah, right. And I was like, Britt, we can't do that. Like, that's not happening. Like, there, it's a, it was clearly a family, very pretty dogs. Oh Tell my god. Tell me the truth. Were the parent dogs actually there? Or are you just saying that? No, I promise. It, uh, Ryan will attest to it. Like, they, they were all right there. And, um, but Ryan didn't, did coach. not help my cause any at all. Cause I was like, <laughs> Brittany's like, uh, we'll take one, and Ryan will take one. I was like, Ryan doesn't want a dog, and he was like. Oh. I would have taken one. <laughs> oh, bro, so... how are you gonna do that to me? Wow. And she was like, "See," and I was like, "I would have taken the parent dogs." Too. I was like, "Where would we have? Where would they go?" It's a we have a five and a half hour drive. We have five and a half hours left in the our drive. The truck bed. The bed was full of gear, full packed to the brim. Out. And Brittany was like, "They'd all sit right. right here the whole drive." And I'm like, <laughs> "You don't know those dogs? They could bite you. They could be covered in fleas, ticks. Ticks pee probably coming from the pee, woods. Pee everywhere." <laughs> Definitely not potty. Well, they're potty trained in the sense that they know to go outside. It was so funny. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Live outside. I know, right? Oh, my God. But that's the dream. You want to, You obviously want to potty train your dogs to pee outside. They know how to do that. That's <laughs> where they came out of the woods. So we almost came home with two, one, two, three, five. I don't even know. But I had to uh, I had to pump the brakes on that, literally, to not hit a puppy. And, and then hit. once I realized there was a whole family crossing the street. Oh, my God. I was like. We're out. <laughs> I started driving. That's production for you. Did yeah. they look bad? Did they look like out of shape? Like, no. They looked like nice, clean dogs? It was on the outskirts of Mexico Beach, like another time. I don't know what town we were going through to get to the highway. Um, I wonder if they were just like, you know, someone's dogs that they are allowed to roam. Yeah. I mean, to have three puppies. And they, you know, they had a little, they had a little girth to them. So they were, they were eating well. Mm. Uh, Mom and dad were full grown um they kind of look like labs almost in a way uh maybe like a you know some sort of lab mix because definitely not full bread um yeah. but some sort of Pits. labs uh, like they were not pit bull mix, they were so. no they were not pit bulls no. they were not when you pit say bulls. mexico beach you mean in florida right yeah okay yeah and that's where uh panhandle um past tallahassee is it kind of like the sticks up there uh-huh okay then yeah. i could definitely see dogs yeah. just roaming around up there yep 100 percent. so Jesus. yeah almost came home with two dogs how okay so aside from that how was the shoot the doc was great. Uh, doc so for the for the yep. listeners. What was the doc? So this is a documentary that we're on called "Built to Last: Buyer mm-hmm. Beware." It is a documentary on housing structures and natural disasters coming through Florida, and how houses, um, you know, in some cases are not built well. They're built to code because mm-hmm. they legally have to be. But the code is the minimum requirement. And a lot of these um, home uh, construction companies, right, yeah. build to code, but it's the minimum requirement. And some areas need to be well above the minimum requirement. So there's a statewide minimum requirement. And then every county can have a few tweaks above the minimum requirement of the state. Um, but, like, we were – for this, this was actually part two of um, – of our production part one happened in the first week of december we were down in fort myers naples and then up here in our region tampa and st pete Mm. Um, that was seven day production across those four cities this one was five days Uh, day one was cedar was uh, lando lakes and cedar key 
And then day two was um, was Tallahassee, Gonos. That's our alma mater. So sure. it was, it was kind of cool just to walk around, like, you know, around campus. Like, we met with a professor. Oh, you went to the campus? Yep. Yeah. When you were just out of town? Yep. Oh, nice. Yeah. One of the, uh, one They're of like, the, Kevin, you're back. Right. One of the interviews was with a professor of um, home design and restoration. Um, that's, you know, the director obviously is calling people and like wow. wanting to get people on the documentary, expert witnesses and different varying opinions on both sides of the argument of um, home, uh, home building. Oh, there was the other side of the argument? Oh, yeah. We've, we, oh. so at this point, we have 30, one interviews completed. Jesus. Yeah. So we That's have a lot. I mean home homeowners, home builders, insurance reps, uh political figures. Um, you know, like one of our interviews in December was the mayor of Naples mm-hmm. that gave us a vantage point of like when they were hit by a hurricane uh what a year ago. Yeah. Uh, and you know how just that was cat- crazy. how catastrophic that was. Just going when I went there with you. Uh, where, where, wherever it was that I went with you. Sorry. It was Naples. Was it Naples? Yeah, it was Naples. It blew my mind because I've already heard about the hurricane hitting and you're so separated from it. It like, you, you, it sounds bad, but you feel bad, but it doesn't really resonate. Yep. If you, especially if you haven't ever gone through something like that. And then seeing it, I was like, oh my God. Yep. I can't, and this has been a year <laughs> since. It's just like, wow, yeah. this is crazy. I mean, some of, some of the d- is a disaster like that. Some of the destruction we've seen is just insane. So, Two weeks ago, Panama City, so we were in Tallahassee for the one day. It was actually technically a day and a half in Tallahassee, and again, it was really nice. Like, went to the College of Business for the professor on, um, he was a professor on um, on uh, catastrophic events and insurance requirements, something along those lines. Um, interviewed him in his office, and then we went out of, out of the College of Business and onto like Landis Green and where the library is and where the food court is. Wow. And so we were able to walk around. We got some drone of campus, uh, went to the stadium and got some footage of Osceola and Renegade, the big statue for Florida State. Your Just, wife went there, right? Yep. Brittany went there? Yep. That's was where it like a big, was it emotional for you guys? No, it wasn't emotional. <laughs> oh. I mean, it was cool. Like, See where I was trying to go with it? Yeah. No, <laughs> no. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, we hadn't been back to campus in five years. So it was kind of cool on this gig like going to campus and like we knew where some good spots to eat were and you know where to where to kind of hang out um for you know when we wrapped and whatnot it was just cool it was a cool you know day and a half on campus went to the one of the one of the shops and got us a few florida new florida state swag items brought the kids back a few things so oh really nice uh, but then after that sworn you sorry wanted to go there recently like i thought you were just saying you wanted to go back and see a game or something yeah we didn't work out this year so but we're hell bent on going to a game next year so um but yeah and then after that, it was Mexico Beach and Panama City Beach. So Panama City Beach is even further um, into the panhandle. They got a tornado two weeks ago. Ooh. And it is like the tornado hit, hit. It caused significant damage. And they just, they just had Hurricane Michael five years ago. Mm-hmm. And the area that the tornado hit. No. Well, I mean, it only hit a small portion of Panama City, yeah. but the destruction looks the same as, as the hurricane. As the hurricane. Wow. So there are, they had um, identified a handful of houses that were damaged five years ago that were damaged in this hurricane, I mean, in this tornado. So a five year difference, same houses, and you can see eerily similar destruction from five years ago to now. Wow. There's a house That's so that is being deemed the tilted house because five years ago, the hurricane knocked it over and it was leaning against its neighbor. Wow. Fast forward five years ago, the tornado went through right through there, and guess what? That house is literally off its foundation, leaning on the neighbor's house again. So I mean, those poor people, the poor neighbors. Can you imagine? I, I, I mean, I, I cracked the joke. I did. I, I just said, like, <laughs> imagine tornadoes coming gone, and you're the neighbor, and you walk outside to see the damage, and you look at your neighbor's house literally leaning, and you go, you just walk back inside and say, "Honey, it happened again." Yeah. It's like. Um, I would just I would leave. I would move. Yeah. Forget rebuilding the um, house. That thing's cursed. So conversation we were having is we want to know who built and subsequently restored the tilted house because clearly it was 
not good the first time and then the second time it happens like are you kidding me and it leaned the same way which not that it yeah. leaning in opposite directions any better but like did the same thing but then on the flip side you almost want to know who built the house that is supporting the other house twice right, now because that's the good house yeah <laughs> it's like whoever house. built that i want that entire crew to build every house in florida because yeah they clearly did something right. You're that it's so right. That's like a crazy article for them that could be written yeah. or like a piece that could be done in that company. That's the best PR they could ever have. Yeah. It's like, look, we can support other houses. Oh, my God. Yeah. Remarkable. But um, no, it, it was great. I mean, it was part two of um, the doc completed production. Um, we have one more round. We have a three-day um, production. Uh, um, we have a three-day um, batch coming up in February. Date TBD. But it'll be two days in Tampa and then they're opening the third for either St. Augustine or maybe going over to Orlando. Um, going to kind of play that one by ear. The director's kind of would be cool. Yeah. He's trying to yeah. find, you know, he has to find a few more. Um, There's a lot of bad areas in Orlando mm -hmm. that just aren't built well yeah. at all. Yeah. So like anything like that's like outside of Disney. Yep. Well, even uh, <laughs> we're not yep. coming after Disney. No, here. no, no. That's a big mistake. No, but any, anything outside of Disney and like, Outside of the city of Orlando, there's a lot of houses that just aren't built yep. well though there. Yeah, so we're we're gonna play around with it and see um, what makes sense. But you know, we have three more days, and then we go into post on this dock in March. So uh, that'll be our fourth documentary we've done in the last year. So Crazy. and yeah. two more, one more, one more already planned, and then let's see what uh, what happens. So yeah, it could be a great year for docs yep. for us. Uh, well, let's go into topics. You had a bunch of topics for us. Yeah. Um, Actually, I know I know where I would like to start. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. All right. You good? And it's uh, you do you king? Yeah, it's a uh, layoff season. That's where oh, I want okay. to start because that to me is a very interesting component of um, you the, see this of the economy. The BTS girl who's doing this. Yeah. He's gonna lay me off right You're now. You're fired. <laughs> that's what's gonna happen. All right. That's <laughs> Actually, it. Actually, I want to talk to you about <laughs> you leaving. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. Um. So yeah, uh, another January come and gone almost as of this recording, mm -hmm. and there's another spike of layoffs that have occurred uh, in you know larger corporations, corporate America, whatever you call it, you, you, all over the country mm -hmm. or in Florida, yep. everywhere, country, okay, country. So, um, and it it's interesting because it primarily you primarily see it in. Fortune 500 large scale companies, right? Okay. Small businesses, yeah, they might have to do layoffs of some capacity, but you obviously, first of all, don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. um, but second of all, we, you know, smaller businesses tend to be a little more slim and understanding of what you can and cannot afford. So, you know, layoffs aren't as common, still common. Sure. But you hear about it because of the Fortune 500s, because, you know, you right now, um, so this January, mass layoffs with Google, NVIDIA, BlackRock, uh, Microsoft had a, a, a large-scale layoff just a week ago, I want to say. Yeah. Um, and then um, another interesting one that hit the headlines was um, – was uh, what's the uh, why am I drawing a blank? What what's the Spanish or you know what's the app that you can learn multiple languages? Duolingo. Duolingo. Thank okay. you. They ha they laid off ten percent of their uh, workforce. Ten percent of how many? Do you know? I don't know. I just okay. saw that it was ten percent. Um, I think in the article it had it. I just don't recall the number. Mm -hmm. um, but it was ten percent, where most of that workforce was was centered around education course curriculum like the course curriculum builders because they have shifted to using ai to create the courses i was wondering if that's where you're gonna yep. go with this whole thing yep because I, I was just ranting about like marketing yep. and can like a solo marketer run a whole marketing department for a company and it just it depends on the size of the company. Right. That's really what it comes down to. Totally. Because Fortune 500, no, one person no. can't do it. I mean, you look at you look at our company we're we're a team of 5, right? And you know, your your role is our marketing content creator and manager. There you go. Um, in which Brittany aids you in that department. You tend you t do to your responsibilities, you take lead on it. Yeah. 
your roles, responsibilities, title, put you in charge of it, but Brittany aids you and some things that you're, you know, that can't be AI automated yet, keyword, because it might yet. be, uh, yeah. yet, while also um, just time and bandwidth, right? You technically cannot do it all because, you know, you need to sleep and eat and see your wife at some point, right? Um, Maybe. Maybe. We'll just, I don't know. Yeah. Um, We're trying to have a baby. So, yes, I have to see her. Yeah. there. <laughs> you need to be present for at least a portion of the day. Yeah. Every other day, at least, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, the, uh, so, yeah. So, it's just interesting. So, uh, mass layoffs, another big thing. Um, I did have the... Um, so, um, I'm looking for a quote. Yeah. So, I have that... Here we go. I found it. 38... Percent of business leaders that were polled said layoffs are likely at the peak in this January. However, yes. they all agree they would not be surprised if there's one more peak of later in the year because of recession concerns. Mm, that's fair. That's so. fair. I've read this quote and I, I saved it. It is. Um from Ariana Huffington, to succeed in this new world, we need to be more creative, more curious, and embrace lifelong learning because machines can't repl replicate that yet. <laughs> I was like, okay. Because when you just said yep. yet, um, I was thinking the other day that, that for every, with AI mm -hmm. and being empowered, and this is probably, this goes hand in hand with layoffs, is like every one employee should now be able to do the job of three employees. So, like, if you have a marketing department, you could essentially cut a third off of it and get the same amount of stuff done mm -hmm. as long as they're all, like, empowered by AI. Yep. What do you think about that? I can understand that, and I certainly believe it. I mean, look, we're we're growing at an alarming – not alarming. That's definitely not the right word. We're growing at an exponential rate and a mm -hmm. rate that I just continue to see going up. I mean, I was – quite literally yesterday telling Brittany because she said like oh, man like we're busy like we she saw she saw another signed contract come through and I was like yeah but we're not even at the boom yet and she was like how are we not at the boom yet and I'm like you'll know when you see it I'm like I can see it on the horizon mm -hmm. and I can see that it's getting an inch closer every day but we're not at the boom yet and she was like floored that I didn't think we were booming yet this year and why didn't you think that um so first of all, just in, Jan just in January, based on what we have done this month, what we have signed, and what we have upcoming, we are going to absolutely blow by and annihilate our 2023 numbers. Like, I'm not talking 5%, 10% increase. I'm talking there could be 30, 40, maybe even a 50% minimum increase on TSM this year comparative to 2023. We are in talks with another documentary. We are in talks with two more two more retainers that would be one year deals. We're in talks with doing um, a relatively large scale commercial gig. On top of what we have just recently signed, which you know we just um, got a few good contracts signed in the last mm -hmm. um, seven to ten days. Mm -hmm. I mean, if. Half of those, what, five things that I just listed, like three of those five sign, we're going to just all of a sudden take another step forward. If all five sign, that's the boom. That's the boom. That's the boom. I mean, and if let's say two of the five sign, guess what? Another two weeks later, we're going to be in discussion with another one, two, three jobs. Mm -hmm. So that boom might just be pushed out a month, yeah. six weeks. I mean- I think I think by end of March, early April, call it call it. Give me that three week window of end of March, early April. I think we are at our max capacity, not able to even see straight, and we're bringing on more team members. Yeah, I mean it's kind of interesting the like confliction that's going on is like in the world we're talking about layoffs happening, yep. and then in our world we're talking about needing more team members. Yep. So how do you think, like, the average small business applies? Do you think – I would – I don't say average in, like, a negative way, but I would say, like, we fit more towards the average mm -hmm. small business where Correct. we're five employees and looking to seek more. 
do you think that's a lot of the case is small businesses are looking to get more people at this point or do you think they're falling into the subset of we need to let people go i think if you're service-based you're looking for people left and right Mm -hmm. which at the end of the day we're service-based right we don't we don't sell a physical product we don't create a physical product we handle a service for our clients mm-hmm. in which yes it's creating photo video advertising marketing collateral um, right but we're not know, selling but we're not like, yeah we're not selling anything product, yeah. i think in the service industry you're a small business is seeking people mm-hmm. we're in this day and age where time is valuable and it's deemed more valuable than it ever was i mean my parents i remember growing up and my parents my mom was oh you know she would work then she'd have to go to the grocery store or pick us up or bring us somewhere and make dinner. Um, my dad would get off and go straight to the house and maybe fix something that night or, uh, changes oil or, um, you know, we, we lived in Indiana, uh, you know, we'd have me and him would have to uh, shovel snow, um, every night if there was no snowstorm coming up. I remember waking up with him cause he'd have to leave the house at like six in the morning. I remember every once in a while him waking me up at five in the morning being like, we had, we had snow last night and we got to shovel this. Um, but all that to say, we are using our time differently i wouldn't say more valuable than how our parents were but just differently yeah. where like in our household we have walmart plus mm-hmm. we got 90 percent of our groceries delivered to us yeah. um i know you and your wife are really big on uber eats and the pre-made not the pre-made meals but the um the boxes that show up at your house that you already you just have a so recipe all the ingredients yeah. and everything i can't remember what it's called yeah you guys have had several of those throughout the years and mm-hmm. um i think you're in a little hiatus of not having it but like i know saving for a house is yeah <laughs> yeah but you guys do that quite frankly a lot when you're yeah. not saving for a house because yeah. it's a little more expensive but it shows up on your doorstep with the instructions the food you still can make a good slash healthy meal or you know combination of both Mm -hmm. but that saves the time because again you're not going grocery shopping you're not researching how to make this meal it's just put in front of you Brittany and i the ai refrigerators no (laughs) what ai refrigerators they were just what is it ces is the consumer electronics right ces they were just unveiled at ces let's just say that and they're refrigerators that have cameras pointing into the refrigerator and they scan what's inside of it. Okay. It looks a little funky because everything has to be lined up pretty well for it to work. I believe this is that. like in its infancy, but it's like it scans what's inside of it. And then as you run out of stuff, it will put in an order mm-hmm. to get the new stuff delivered to you. Interesting. So it's like as long as it knows what you like to eat and what you like to have on stock. Well, it's going to learn. Like, it'll learn machine learning yep. and computation of knowing what it is. It'll just throw it on your Amazon that list d- and order it for you. Wait till that thing can scan your whole kitchen because it's gonna like in our house it's gonna freaking tell us that we're out of bananas and apples yeah. <laughs> every every seventy two hours. Um, <laughs> oh my god, strawberries, blueberries. We go through fruit like none none other in our house, and I can just see I can just see it putting in our cart every se- every three days. Like you need more bananas and more strawberries. It's like yes, we do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you look at like you, you're talking about looking at time and how we use our time differently. And your examples are outside of work. What are your thoughts of how we use our time differently inside of work? Well, okay. So I know I kind of took a slight detour there. Yes, I think everybody in our company and most small businesses have two, three, sometimes four responsibilities. I personally don't think if you have four primary responsibilities, then nothing's primary, right? Um, If you look at our company, I do think everybody has two primary responsibilities, and probably two secondary responsibilities that you're allowed to not look at the secondary responsibility if a primary is, you know, there's in need of something to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the the so so yes to that portion of your of your question. AI is definitely helping us because it's it's you know ChatGPT. I mean, our whole team has it. We have the the paid plus plan, you know. We're constantly using chat in some capacity. You're using a few additional programs. Uh, our editor is using AI with uh, with audio mixing, cleaning up audio, and um, and mixing music. 
gets him again gets him 80 90 percent there still have to do a final pass you can't fully trust it because i mean he he cracked the joke with me the other day that one of one of the videos that you know he used ai to clean up the audio mm -hmm. there was a tiny little sound in the background of one of the video of interviews someone probably closed the door you know uh you know, a, a ringtone went off or something. I think that was actually yeah. the example was uh, someone's phone went off in the back, like okay. the interviewers. I got something for you. I, I got something to show him to fix that. And it, well, he fixed it very quickly, but he didn't, like you're, my point is don't automatically trust it. It's gonna get you 90% there, but you still have to watch it and double check. Yeah. He's watching and all of a sudden it just, it just was, you know, good, 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 and good. And it was like, what the, f mm -hmm. what was that? And then he just had to, he just had to clean it up and. He put, uh, I don't know what he did, to be completely honest. I don't edit. So, <laughs> uh, but he cracked the joke that someone's phone went <laughs> off so and AI had a blip yeah. and he cleaned it up and I couldn't tell you where it was. Mm -hmm. I watched the video the next day, approved it, sent it to the client, could not tell you where it was. But he, again, he cracked the joke being like, AI almost <laughs> almost screwed me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um but yeah, I mean, everybody on our team is using using something AI related every day, every other day. I mean, I am. I used I used chat twice this morning and it's starting to scare me. Like I'm all for AI, but it definitely is starting to scare me the more I'm like looking into and learning about it because you know, like for Ken's example, it's like a great it, it's great that he checked it. But there's a lot of people who aren't checking mm -hmm. and who are just letting AI do it. And it's like <clears throat> chat, you shouldn't, I don't, this is where I'm kind of wondering, should you allow chat to do 90% of the work and you do 10% of the cleanup or should you do 90% of the work and chat do 10% of the cleanup? And then how do you apply? Like, obviously there's certain scenarios where mm -hmm. in editing, you know, like the AI at that point is kind of only doing 10%, mm -hmm. but when it can do 90 when do you let that happen and that's what's starting to worry me is like even people who build chat gpt prompts right now they're doing like one sentence or two sentence mm -hmm. and they're not really it's not even really a prompt at that point no. you're just saying something and it's there's, responding and who knows what it's responding it's with not a not. prompt if it's one sentence long like there's yeah. just that that's baseline information that's mm -hmm. that's a starting point if you but will. a lot of people are using it that way because yeah. they don't understand what a prompt actually is mm -hmm. And then in that way, they're getting this like skewed or bad information and things like that. So like, that's what's spooking me right now mm -hmm. is that a majority of people who don't know how to use it and are just throwing everything at it. And then they're just getting whatever comes back and putting it out there. And not vetting it. Right. I mean, we, I was having um, chat to a, uh, analyze a transcript on an interview for me. Was, the interview was like an hour 20. It was long. And I knew there was so much good information, but I needed it to break it down for me and just kind of get me started. And I, it was kind of the, you know, I was going to let it do 20% of the work and I was going to then finish up the other 80. And um, I asked it to give me, you know, direct quotes, word for word, directly from the transcript. And Next thing you know, it you know it funnels a bunch of bunch of information to me. I mean, an hour twenty interview and probably fed me thirty of that minutes back. Oh wow! And I asked, you know, I prompted it to give me a lot of information, expand on the quotes. You know, I wanted a lot back, but I needed it to be less than the, than less than the two hours that um, we had we had gotten. And I probably was about four or five sentences in. When I started realizing something was off, and I was like, that's weird. I don't, I was there for this interview, and I don't really, even though it was a two hour interview, I was like, I don't really remember her saying this. Okay, cool. <laughs> Another four, five, six sentences in, and I'm like, there's no way this is right. And I literally said, are, are, what you just provided to, to me is this direct quotes from this transcript and it's like no no i paraphrased and extended the information to be easily digestible and i was like oh. <laughs> even though i had said give me direct quotes word for word from this transcript mm -hmm. Were and you using the gpt i built too yeah it's even in there yeah not to it, not to hallucinate basically yep. And it, it still did. And then I reiterated, changed my vernacular slightly, and then it fed me really good 
direct quotes as it should. Yeah. But granted, again, I was in the interview room when that was happening. So I, you know, like I'm just, I'm 10 sentences in and I'm just like, this isn't right. Like mm-hmm. there, I, look, I, I know I wasn't the one conducting the interview. I was a, I was the DP behind the camera. So I was mostly listening, but I wasn't fully listening. But even the, the little alarm bells in my head were like, mm, this seems a little too off. Yeah. Sure enough. So you have, you have to vet it. You have to verify the information because if I would have, if I wouldn't have, I would have gone an hour into my work, condensing, consolidating, picking lines that I wanted. Just off. to have wasted your time yeah. entirely. Yeah. Because then we wouldn't have been able to find the direct quotes later. It, it, it would have wasted, it not only would have wasted my time, but it would have wasted my editor's time. And that's not fair to any of us, but you have to verify the information. Yeah. So the very next transcript, I asked the prompts and everything again. And before I even started reading, I said, to verify, like I let it spit it out to me. Mm-hmm. And I said, to verify, these are direct quotes, correct? Yes, these are direct quotes as requested. So then I, then I, the second one, I was good to go. Wow. But because I learned, I'm like, no, no, no. From now on, I'm asking to verify, because if it tells me no, then the prompt yeah. got skewed or, or hallucinated. Do you remember the AI I was using for a while that it turned out not to be so great, but it was more like you could see the brain of it going on. Mm-hmm. I forget what it was called, like Super Chat or some Super Chat AI. Mm-hmm. I don't know, something like that. And, um, Whenever you did something, it it had to provide you with a justification on how it got its answer. Gotcha. And in chat GPT, it's it not. doesn't have to give you a no. justification. So like what you just learned is request the justification. Yeah. And again, that's just something that people don't realize. I learned that because I was looking at the super AI chat, whatever mm-hmm. it was called, and seeing what it actually does in the back end will it so it'll inform your decisions as a prompter like crazy. And you can go and chat and ask it to open up its sandbox so you can see what's actually happening. Oh, really? I see. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. That's cool. And then that'll kind of blow your mind. Because you're like, all this is happening? And it's, it's processing things that I didn't even ask just to see if it can get to my answer. Yeah. yeah it's it's digesting everything, if you will. Crazy. That's cool. Crazy. Um, yeah, this is a topic I want to talk about on the next one. But it's just to kind of like introduce it is that the majority of content that we're seeing now on the internet is AI generated. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really scared about is what happens when the loop happens. When, when the loop of AI generating content based off of AI generated content, then what do we get? It's what, isn't that what the issue mid journey had? That's exactly what mid journey had. Yeah. And those pictures that we got for a week were insane. They had to like recalibrate everything. Yep. It was so far off. But what happens when information gets like that? I don't know. Right. I actually do. I'm, I'm interested. That's what scares me. We'll, we'll talk about it on the, the okay. next one. Um, I don't know what time we're at. I think we're at 30 minutes. Okay. Um, you want to talk about the buildings? Yeah, let's do the buildings because it will kind of tie into... All right, so because of the layoffs, because of the two, three responsibilities, or in my my opinion, two primary responsibilities, two secondary responsibilities, Mm -hmm. um, it all kind of leads to being more efficient and the the, the belief that a recession is coming. And with that, um, I have a... Uh, I have a statistic for you that maybe you notice around here in our region, but uh, 19.6% of office spaces aren't being leased, which is the highest since 1979. And this is specific to commercial real estate. Okay. So that's insane. Commercial real estate, 16, uh, ni- sorry, 19.6% of office spaces are not being leased least and that is the highest since 1979 knee-jerk reaction what are you thinking there in our area in particular it's something i don't want to talk about <laughs> and maybe some viewers can get an idea of what i'm saying but like just thinking outside of my gut reaction and the emptiness i kind of maybe this isn't what you're expecting but i kind of go yeah. back to like when covid hit and how people were working remote and inside that time is kind of when we discovered AI, mm-hmm. which is also kind of weird. Um, 
and then not necessarily needing to be in an office plus the like price the going way up yeah. on how much everything costs well the price for office space has skyrocketed at the tail end of covid right but it's not it hasn't gotten much lower to my knowledge no i mean right. it probably has in some capacity if you're if we're at pretty much 20 percent, you know it's come down we just you know how much yeah so I think I, I'm kind of stuck in that culmination of all those things happening. And then for us to not even need the office space, what do you think? I mean, we need office space. Yeah. We do. I mean, we have, you know, gear. We do productions in the studio. I mean, we're not doing a production in um, in our kitchen, for example. Like, it's not happening, even though technically. Well, we are in a week We are so. in, a, in two weeks. We're doing a fun project. That's going to be a fun <laughs> one. Um, and, yes, it's going to be in our kitchen. But – you know, we're not going to take green screen and put it in our Florida room and do a, and bring a client over and be like, let's do this. Yeah. Like, that's not happening. Yeah. We just had American Heart in our studio for two days, what, a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, that wouldn't happen at our house. So we need office space. Our industry needs office space or commercial space, studio space, whatever you consider yeah, it. I was, yeah. But, I don't know if you, what it's, what it would actually be. Would it be office space or would it be storage space or like, like a studio space? Is like actually needing offices. Are you, now for our industry, like for what we do, we need office slash studio space. We need some sort of commercial real estate property to be yeah. in. Now, whatever term Creative you want to, yeah, whatever term you want to use, office studio doesn't matter. It's you know the blanket term is office space, and there's multiple versions of that. Like we have what two offices here, a gear prep room, a green room, and a large studio space. Mm -hmm. In its base term, it's an office. Okay, my mind just doesn't go there. Yeah, because the way we utilize the space is not necessarily as an office. But, mm. you know, if you call a commercial real estate agent, you're going to be like, I need an office. And these are the parameters. Like, um, most large companies are abandoning, mo most large and medium sized companies, it's actually scaling down to medium size, are abandoning their locations either in full or downsizing heavily. Companies of 25, 40, 50 employees will have half the people be remote and work in their home office, and then they go into a smaller space, saving on revenue because they can just have the people work from home. Now, there's some very definitive pros and cons to that, right? If you're I was going to say, because wasn't there studies that came out saying that you were getting less productivity when people weren't in the office space? You know, I I think... I'm at odds with it. I can see how productivity will lessen. I can. I can see it. I can understand the argument. I can understand the statistics. And when I talk to other you know, business personnel, I can see how they view it that way. But it's hard because for our team, we don't have that issue. So if you have the right team, if you have everybody on board for the greater cause of the company, we don't have that issue. Right. I mean, our editor has n quite literally never had an editing bay here at our studio, and he never will. I mean, things have to. I mean, things have to drastically change. I mean, like. Yeah. A, a, a straight 180 about face for him to have an uh, an editing bay here. He works from his home office that's been retrofitted for him, and it works great for him. And he gets everything done. We have no issues. Everything's hunky dory, and we're fine. Ryan has a home office as well. I mean, he's in the field, what, 60, 70% of the time. And then the other 30%, he's helping produce uh, or even coloring our content. He's our colorist as well. But he doesn't have to come to the office to do that. Brittany has a home office. Mm -hmm. I have my office here at the studio, right behind this wall. <laughs> and Brittany has a home office. Yeah. She comes here once every other week for something. You and I are the ones who are here most of the time. Even I've been getting cabin fever, which I feel like is hurting my productivity being in the office in a weird way. Yeah. It's like, I feel like I need to get out to have like my creative juices flowing yep. again. So that's when I said I'm a little conflicted about it is 
when people get out into the world, they find themselves. Mm -hmm. You don't find yourself in your office. Maybe you have epiphanies, but like you don't get that. Yep. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. This yep. like sense of self that you find mm -hmm. outside of the office. And I think that's so much more valuable when you come back with that yep. and apply that to your work. Yeah. But if your office is your home, that's tough. That could be the same problem as you yeah. just described. Yeah. Cause we figured it out. We figured it out. So I think there needs to be some sort of hybrid element for a lot of people to be fully successful. Now our editor, he year in and year out has had success, no issues. He's one that we don't have to make any adjustments. Ryan would lose his ever loving mind if he was in front of the computer every day, if he was in, in the office, whether it's home office or here every day, mm -hmm. but he goes out into the field and is one of our, one of our DPs and one of our, he, he man, he, he's our lead production person for a reason. So he gets that set, that layer of separation. Brittany will, you know, she handles all of our photography. So she's on any photography job. She was just on the documentary for five days. So she, kind of, you know, again, filled her cup being in the field for five days. Now she has today, tomorrow, and Friday in the office, probably Monday in the office. And then I'm pretty sure she has a, she has a, a gig on Tuesday, if not Wednesday, but regardless. So the second she's about to get cabin fever, office fever, whatever you want to call it, she's going to be on a job. Yeah. So that works out. Right. Um, the, I, I know some companies are making it mandatory to be in the office, you know, two days a week, three days a week. I can understand why you need to see your people. You need to have face to face conversations. And sometimes that face to face element can be more productive than texting or phone calls. You and I talk all the time, but there's something about that face to face element that takes our conversations to a net to the next level. Mm -hmm. And it happens every time to the point yeah. that when you and I have to leave at a very specific time, we, we essentially announce it to one another. I have to be out of here at 4.30. Like to Like packing while talking. Yeah. And like totally prepped to like walk I, out the door. Yeah. Like full disclosure, I'm out of here at 4.45 today. I got Connor soccer practice. Mm -hmm. So if we get into a big conversation at 4 o'clock, I'm pretty much setting an alarm because you and I will go down five different rabbit holes on one conversation. <laughs> Um, which is all great, but you know, you gotta also leave at some point. Yeah. So, um, that the hybrid element I think is where companies are going to land, which makes it large commercial spaces obsolete, or it's only being used for major companies. I mean, look at Amazon, you see an Amazon fulfillment center everywhere, right? Like yeah. that makes sense. Um, Google, Microsoft, you know, there's going to be certain regions that just make sense. I mean, just in Tampa, the, the Sykes building was, changed, right? it was sold. Sykes was sold in what Q3 of last year. And to my knowledge, I think it's still vacant. And that was six months the, ago. Vacant. The whole thing. Yeah. No, the whole thing. To my knowledge. Yes. They sold wow. Sykes, and maybe I'll we'll verify that and see if maybe on the next podcast I can, um, you yeah. know, ensure that. That's th crazy. But I'm pretty if sure. That's right. That's insane. Yeah. There's so many offices. Yes. I've been up and down that building. I know. And seen all those offices. I know. I've been there twice, once, twice, but it was massive. Wow. I, I mean, look how large it is. But to my knowledge, and I will verify this for the next podcast. Stay tuned. I'll get you that info pretty much to start episode, uh, the next episode. I think it's vacant. Which is just like, right? Like, boom, mind boggling. Yeah, that's horrible. So, but before we end, because I know we're pretty much at time, and this is our last topic anyway, companies that are growing, the service industry that's always looking for people, right? Small businesses, I think we're the ones who benefit from that 19.6% of vacancies because we can level up at an affordable rate, at a fair rate, mm -hmm. because that real estate market not only home and commercial home and commercial that just skyrocketed post covid we at renewal as you know didn't move because prices were it's like insane gouged i mean absolutely insane. and we were no just offense, yeah we, we're in 2200 square feet here and all we wanted to do was get to like 
4,000. We weren't even trying to like, we just, we need to upgrade. We're bursting at the seams here. But we just wanted to just do a one step upgrade. Like nothing crazy. It's not like we were trying to get to 10,000 square feet. We're trying to go from 2,200 to 4,000, 2,200 to 4,500 maybe. We were kind of eyeballing. Mm -hmm. And the prices were just astronomical. And I was like, no. So we exercised our option and we re-signed here at a, again, fair and affordable rate. But now that the this number continues to climb, I think it's going to allow small businesses that need to expand, that need to just be in slightly larger spaces, that like small, medium size, 4,000, 4,500 square feet, because it's not small, but it's also not medium size. I consider medium size to be like 10,000 square feet. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be more affordable for us. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's more like you don't necessarily need the office space is like where my mind goes yep. of actually needing an office, but you need a creative space. Yes. I think more and more businesses need that, like especially service businesses. Yep. Because you need a place to do your services and all that sort yep. of stuff. And most of them are creating something. Our next door neighbor, I mean, they have two offices in there. That's mm -hmm. it, two, with that big open centralized space that you know they use for pretty all their meetings and um collaborations and then they have a and then they use the what the warehouse space which we obviously converted to a studio they use that for parts um repairs deliveries so they have a little bit of you know all three office creative space and warehouse service fixing this yeah. um fixing pieces office being the smallest part of it office being so the your smallest. traditional office spaces yeah because yeah. technically here we have four. We've just used two as an office, one for gear, prep, and one for a green room for clients to hang out. I mean, out. out of the four, three of them were offices, and then you're like, we don't need this. Exactly. <laughs> we actually down. You're right. We actually downgraded an office to become a gear room yeah. where we got the roll away. We can do all sorts of gear maintenance. And it's more valuable. And, and we more use cost it. Effective. We use it ten times more than we used to. Yeah. So it's how we should have had it from the get get go. But you know, you live and learn. Mm -hmm. But. Um, all right, tease, tease us. What are we talking next episode? Uh, next episode, we're going to talk more about AI and what all that involves. Um, let me pull up my notes. I'm going to get. A, I'm going to find out the true bit on the Sykes building for us Tampa people. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to talk about defining professionalism, the rise of vertical content and social media, and what potential does it actually hold okay. versus what do we see now. Um, AI's integration into media and like we talked about that loop oh, and the yeah. content and oh, what's yeah. going to happen in that place. Well, we just went down a rabbit hole the other day via text was the content spiraling down to hell. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's def I'm pretty sure that's the, the exact quote you gave me and I was like yeah, I, I mean I fed you to that direction and mm -hmm. then you hit me with that line and I was like that is so accurate. And then um, I mean we pretty much touched on it All right, AI empowerment in the workforce but maybe we can go a little deeper on that all right and if there's only one thing you take out of this episode viewers is puppies did not come to it back to our house i'm so grateful we did not come home with puppies you're a horrible person for leaving I, those dogs I, on I understand this about myself and i accept it now the viewers know <laughs> all right see you see you